going to be here for about 15 minutes before we go over to Knight Memorial Library. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the project and then introduce David Wells, um, the artist for this site. I hate these things. So I'm the executive director of the Providence Preservation Society and I've already been asked. Uh, we're not going inside. I hope you didn't think we were. Um, we would love to be able to do that, but the owner is uh, unwilling to let us inside. She was unwilling to let uh, David inside to take any oh. footage, so uh, that's been disappointing. Um, but this is the first, um, I guess, Hi. exhibit, first program of this project we've called Sites and Stories Explored Through Scholarship, Art, and Community Engagement. Um, nearly two years ago, we conceived of, a, conceived of a project that would help us bring some stories to life about some of the sites that we consider endangered and to tell those stories in a way that preservation society would not necessarily think to do. And to do that, we engaged artists, uh, and we paired them with scholars from the community. Uh, Richardson Ojedan here is our local scholar for this site. Um, <laughs> must be tired, he's sitting, he's sitting down. <laughs> Bad back, <laughs> back's bothered. Um, but really what we wanted to know was what are the, aside from what we often tell the histories of these sites, what are the histories of the people who lived, worshiped, played, um, and otherwise used these, these places? So last fall we selected five artists or artist teams to create new works related to four different sites on our endangered list from last year. Um, and since last fall they've uh, worked with scholars, they've done independent research, and they've uh, modified what their original proposal was to create a project um, that would suit the timeline, the budget, and the scholarship they were able to, um, to ascertain. So tonight we're going to see uh, the products of this process for both uh, the Broad Street Synagogue um, and Knight Memorial Library. So we want these, these works to provoke uh, conversations about potential uses um, or uh, other histories of the sites that we may not often recognize. And I just want to thank uh, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, and the Rhode Island, uh, or sorry, Providence Art, Culture, and Tourism for their support. Um, so before I introduce David, So before I introduce David, just briefly about the building. It was built around 1910 to 1911 as Temple Bethel for the Reformed Jewish Congregation of the Sons of Israel and David. Um, later, it was a uh, congregation of Shari Zedek, and uh, now we call it Broad Street Synagogue, um, commonly. Um, for PPS, uh, we've been concerned about it since 2010 when it was first on our list. Um, we took it off the list for a couple years for some reason but we've had it on there every year since 2014. Along with the Industrial Trust Building, we consider that it's one of the most important endangered buildings in Providence. And so the reason we're concerned about it currently is that it needs a roof. And uh, if you were able to go inside, you would have been able to see that they repaired the plaster a few years ago, and without a new roof, it's now collapsing again. So um, it's still got time. Uh, it's not in imminent danger of collapse or anything, but without attention in the near future, uh, we could be faced with that. So in about 15 minutes, we're going to walk back over there to view the film and talk to Walker Metling, our other artist who's in the crowd somewhere. There he is. Um, for right now, uh, I'm going to turn it over to David Wills. <laughs> the owner of the building is a trust in Carolyn Raffaellian's name. Yeah, right there. Got that much. Ooh. Ugh. Too many pieces. Too many pieces. Too many pieces. All right. Can you all hear me now? Thank you for coming out. And yes, the same question I've been asked by five different people. We are not going to see the movie here. You have to listen to me for about six or seven minutes, and then we're going to walk over. We're going to go inside a dark room, and then you will see the movie. So if you have just a little patience, I think we'll go a long way. So... My notes. Thank you for coming out. How many of you have been inside that building? That's pretty impressive because I have yet to be inside that building. How many of you were ever in that building when it functioned as a synagogue? That's what I was kind of hoping somebody put their hands up because I really wanted to get talk to that person about getting some pictures. And then I want to talk about why am I making so much noise? Get the paper in front of the speaker. You think it's right there? Yeah. Uh, Ah, cha cha cha. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, all those usual thank yous, I really do want to restate them. No wonder that's what it is. That's interesting. Put it over there. Okay. Can I do it now? There we go. Uh, thank you, Providence Preservation Society. 
um, the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Arts. No, lo no longer working. See? Now is it working? What did I do wrong? Now it's working. I'll just keep it over there. All right. Talk loud. I could just talk loud. Maybe I'll just do that. I'll just talk loud, okay? I'll talk loud. So I've been in the audience for these kinds of things many times, and I always wondered, why do people say that? You still want it? All right. We're going to get there slowly, slowly, slowly. Welcome to a PPS program. Yeah. I wanted to repeat those thank yous because those people really made this thing possible. This particular project had a number of opportunities to go wrong, many, many of them. And I'm only going to tell you about a few of them, but the people that were thanked before that I just thanked, they really made this thing possible. So when I saw the call for submission from PPS, I looked over the most endangered properties and I was immediately drawn to this building, partly because I'm Jewish, but over my career I photographed many different sacred spaces. And in fact, I've been involved in three different projects with synagogues that took on new lives. And so this immediately caught my attention. I was thrilled when you called me up and said, you got it. Um, I suspect you might not have been so happy. I think that I've been one of those pain in the ass artists who made Brent really work for a living because um, it probably sucked up a whole lot more time than you planned, but he persisted. So my first thank you to you. Second one to Mary Beth Meehan, who I don't see here today. Great. She encouraged me to apply and she also kept saying, no, no, don't give up. Don't let that little problem stop you. Um, like Mary Beth, my background is in photojournalism which left me with a few traits that helped me in this project. First, I have a high level of curiosity. I like to know where, when, why, what, how, etc. And so immediately the building intrigued me. When somebody says no to me, I usually take that as a challenge rather than an answer. And finally, like all good photojournalists, I'm very good at making something out of nothing. So as you may know, between 2008 and 2011, the, the former occupants of the synagogue, Congregation Beth Shalom, tried to sell this and that was right at the peak of the housing crisis. And so that wasn't going to go too well. The building was neglected, as Brent was talking about. The roof collapsed, the uh, copper on the top in a lot of different parts was removed and sold um, for, for uh, scrap. People ended up squatting in there, and it really kind of went downhill after that. In 2014, a nonprofit dedicated to turning the building into a community center was formed by among other people, and some of them are here today, Adam Bush, Nathaniel Weisenberg, and Sam Seidel. Yes. Once I contacted them and explained to them what I was doing, they were incredibly generous to me. They sent me all this stuff, and a lot of it really ended up shaping the finished project that you are going to see in a few minutes. I, I promise you, you will see the movie. Um, in 2014, Joe Triangelo purchased the building, um, and despite the many people's best efforts, including the group that I just mentioned, it ended up back on the Providence Preservation Society's most endangered list. And then by the time I started this project last fall in 2018, I couldn't get inside the building. And I have yet actually to be inside the building. So those of you who have seen it, I'm jealous of you. Um, at this point in time, I'm getting a little despondent. And the next thanks goes to my wife, Anu Matthew, because she said, no, you can't give up. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. And it was another opportunity to say, nah, I'll just take his money and run, but I kept going. The next person to enter my story and help me on my journey is the, the uh, project scholar brought on by PPS, Richardson Ogden, who we, again, he's the executive director of the Southside Cultural Center, Rhode Island. He knows the area, he knows the community. We spent an afternoon together. We talked a lot about it, about this idea of religious spaces taking on new lives. He has been one of a number of advocates, many advocates, some of whom are here, for turning this into a community center. It's not rocket science, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. But he gave me some more things to think about. So that got me interested in the question of how many synagogues there once were in the Providence area and what has become of them. So at this point in time, Geraldine Foster, Rabbi Barry Dollinger, Roberta Winkleman, and Ruth Brendel took my phone calls, answered my emails, and in the case of Rabbi Dollinger, he actually sat down face to face with me. And they encouraged me to keep going. They, did, they said, don't stop. Keep going, keep going. Apparently, there were once about two dozen synagogues in the greater Providence area. Three of those are in the heart of Providence right now. They are under the Marriott at 48 Orm Street. Yeah, one of the many things that I learned along the way and something I'm hoping to maybe do something on in the future is what happened to those other 10 synagogues. 
Three of those, as I said, are in the heart of uh, where the Marriott is. I ended up with a list of 10 one-time synagogues where the buildings are still standing because that became my, my point of interest is if there's still a building here. They're in Cranston, Pawtucket, Providence, Warwick. And my personal favorite, which is way out in Arctic Village. Does anybody know where Arctic Village is? Way out in West Warwick. You go all the way out there, there's this little tiny building that you know immediately used to be a synagogue, and it's probably a private house because it's so small. Um, I went and looked at them all. I ended up focusing on eight, and then five of which ended up in the film that you will see, I promise. I continued the project with the help of Caitlin LaRoche, the executive director of the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association. She verified my list, she helped me find more contacts, and she supplied me with many of the images that you will see in the final film. And that was a huge, huge help. The only thing that pained me more than not getting inside that building is the fact that most of the photos that are going to be in the movie, you'll see, don't have credits. And so, put your name on your photos. Please, somebody like me in the future is going to come look at your photos. Either the prints, the sound of Rhode Island, or electronically, so please, please. Thankfully, Jory Ketton, who did make some of the photos that are going to be in the film, had her name on them, and so I want to give her a big thanks. So I got a list of synagogues, which had taken on new lives. There were eight of them, and I reached out to all eight. Five of them welcomed me. Three of them, you can do the math. Um, Andy, Andy Stupard, Father Juan Batista, Lena Agostino, Mahesh Patel, Maggie Stubbard, Will Yon, Will, Rilwan Fayestan, and a Hindu priest by the name of Somnatha. I don't know if any of you are here, but if you aren't, you were very gracious and you let me come in. They all said sure. They were kind of mystified by what I was doing. But when I explained to them this idea that these had been synagogues and they'd taken on new lives, everybody was incredibly welcoming. So at this point, I still haven't been able to get inside our friend over here. So I ended up filming the other buildings, and then I sat down to put the film together, talked to Mary Beth Meehan, showed iterations to Brent Runyon, showed iterations to Anu, and then Holly Ewald and Maureen Taylor, who I know are here, chimed in with a couple of emails that gave me really, really interesting feedback on how to restructure it. And so I thank them as well. And lastly, near the end, a Providence-based sound artist by the name of Elizabeth Fausick, who teaches at Emerson and creates soundscapes for a living, came in and made this really extraordinary soundscape. And sadly, she can't be here today. She's down in uh, Texas watching her brother get married. So that's more important. But I think that I wish she was here because I'm guessing you're going to want to give her a lot of love after you hear as well as see the movie. So this film, like so many other films, like so many other things in life, proves that it takes a village. And so all of you who are here were some small part of helping me create this film and being part of that village. If you like the film, which I hope you will, will and you'll see it here in a few minutes, share it. There'll be links, they'll be posted. PPSRI wants to share it, I want to share it. And we can see if we can do something to get people inside of there. Thank you very much for coming out.